Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to talk about the ins and outs of model validation. So before we even start this video, I'm gonna make the big disclaimer here at the beginning. Um, everything in this video, all the presentations, slides, um, it's all my opinion as somebody who has been a uh, practitioner as well as a consultant across many banks. This is just an accumulation of my thoughts and opinions on how validation should work. Um, every bank's gonna be different. This is by no means a shadowing or like indication of how any specific bank is doing it, but let's dive on in. All right, so let's start off with a big picture view here. Let's go through kind of the process of risk management and models in general, and then we'll dive in specifically to the model validation. Um, first off, you need a business reason for building a model, okay? So you have something you need to price, um, you have something that you need to predict. Um, you're gonna need a business reason on why you need this. Is this gonna be used for customer marketing? Again, is this gonna be used for pricing? Uh, is this gonna be used for regulatory capital requirements? For example, like in CCAR, um, what is the business need here? So this should be the risk return analysis. Um, so for example, to make this simple in pricing, if you're pricing an asset, uh, you wanna price customers fairly so that you, know, you give them a good deal, they come to you for business, but at the same time, you need to look at that risk. Um, are we gonna get enough return from these customers given the pricing structure? Um, so this is like the risk return kind of trade off. This is where a lot of you are all excited in the investment side because this is like you actually doing the trading, for example, or generating the business. The second part here is gonna be the model development itself. So once the business has defined what they need, all the requirements that the model is supposed to do, they give it to a development team. Model development here is going to mitigate risk by building a model to do exactly what you're doing. So again, on something simple like trading, for example, uh, if you're gonna be buying and selling something, if you're gonna do like market making, for example, you wanna make sure that you are incorporating all of the correct risks and that the model itself is going to price them correctly um, so that you're managing the risk that you're taking by going through this business process that we did in step one. Now, after the model is developed, it goes to a validation team. The validation team themselves will review the model. Um, they manage the risk associated with the model itself and a little bit with the development side of actually using it. Um, we'll look at that here in more detail as we talk about validation. But validation's job is to mitigate the risk associated with the model. Next, the model is actually implemented into use. So there's implementation teams. Um, implementation here in a way is reducing risk because they're implementing the model itself. So they're actually doing the implementation of risk reduction through the model that has been developed and the model that has been validated. And then finally, from a big bird's eye view here, uh, internal audits gonna review the entire process. They're gonna look at everything from the business use, the development, the validation, the implementation. Um, they're gonna give their feedback. They're gonna make sure everything's within scope of policy, um, everything's being done correctly, and that we don't have any gaps kind of in the entire process of managing the risk here. And finally, we have performance monitoring. Um, this is gonna be, depending on where you put it in your business model, a lot of times the business itself will actually be monitoring this. Sometimes the developers will help with this. But in general, what's gonna happen is you're gonna see if the model's doing what it's supposed to do and it's behaving the way it's supposed to behave. If not, then you would end up going through the entire process again saying, you know, model failed performance monitoring, it no longer works given, you know, our performance monitoring plan. And then you'd start all over again and the business would have another need. So the same need as before, but you'd update the model and go through the process again. And you just continue to loop through this over time, um, determining if you need a new model and then determining if you can continue to use your current model. And then talking about what model validation does, model validation is going to review this entire process, which we're gonna go through here in a second. Um, it looks at everything in great detail. And then things that we see that are issues, things that are model risks. So for example, maybe variable selection wasn't done correctly. Maybe it's the wrong model structure. Maybe it's something as simple as there's nothing documented on something you did that's crucial for the model. Um, model validation will then write findings. And then these findings have to be remediated by your development team or by your business, depending on where the finding falls. And then they will go back in and they will actually fix these issues with the model if possible. Uh, model validation also should be writing recommendations or limitations. So things that can't be fixed, for example, that's like a weakness in the model structure. We know it, um, it's the best model we could come up with. That would be like a limitation. Um, if there's something that's not necessarily crucial to the model or maybe something that should have been explored more but validation hasn't had time to explore it and the developers didn't explore it, these can be also recommendations like validation would recommend you go through this new type of model or this new type of process 
perhaps maybe in the future when you do redevelopment, this should be considered. But those are kind of the things that we're gonna be doing here is like we're gonna be going through, reviewing everything with a fine tooth comb, um, doing additional analysis, reviewing what was done, and then writing issues and findings as a way to kind of mediate the risk associated with the model and the model development process. But anyways, let's dive on in here to kind of these steps of validation itself. Okay, so once the model is developed, um, it's supposed to be packaged and handed off to validation. Um, this packaging process at a lot of banks is usually kind of messy. There's usually not a lot of clear, concise ways of doing it. Uh, every bank has their own method though. They choose, you know, we hand it off through internal systems. We hand it off through external file sharing systems, for example. But in general, I think it's packaged from development and handed to validation. Um, validation then goes through and reviewing everything. Um, in these kind of major five steps, you could combine the last two steps into one and have four steps, but I like to view it as five steps. Um, these steps are going to be data. So you have all this data you're gonna use for this development. Um, the second one's gonna be the model theory. So theoretically, are you picking the right structure, variable selection and all that? Third is going to be model output. Does the model perform as expected? Is it doing what we want it to do? Does it make a lot of sense? Uh, fourth is gonna be documentation. Um, was everything documented clearly? And then fifth is gonna be governance, which goes in that final component of the performance monitoring, um, following basically like model inventory components so we can track these over time um, and different things like that. So to dive in here now to data specifically, the questions you should be asking yourself, the things that validation should be looking at is, where is the data coming from? Are exclusions applied? Are they reasonable? And are they excluded correctly? So you wanna look at things like, for example, in loans, if you have deceased customers, you're not gonna to wanna to include them into your data set. It's gonna screw your data set a bit. Um, they're no longer gonna be customers. It's kind of a grim part of working in you know, finance. Um, but yeah, you're not gonna have these customers. You're gonna to wanna to exclude them. There are gonna be other exclusions you'll want to apply as well. Um, but also, are these done correctly? So you need to go through the code itself. You need to look at how the exclusions are applied. You need to look at the data before the exclusions, after the exclusions, you know, do some testing, make sure that what was written and what is actually occurring is going to happen and your exclusions are applied correctly. Also challenge your exclusion. So just because the developer lists out and says, you know, I excluded X, Y, and Z, and you know, it makes complete sense because of this, 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 and this, and then they do the exclusions, you need to go back and challenge them if you disagree with it. Um, consistency, again, across different models, making sure exclusions are applied the same across different models if the uses are similar and if they should be the same. Ask those questions, dig deep, figure out why they're not. Um, the next one is how do you handle missing values and outliers? These are things that need to be reviewed. Um, a lot of people handle them differently. For example, in time series, uh, I'm not a fan of excluding outliers for a variety of reasons. However, some people take like average as a means if there's a missing data point. Most likely though, for example, in time series, you won't have outliers. If you have large data sets and you're modeling things, um, outlier detection could be a crucial fact that would skew your model or bias your results. Um, these might be cases where you know it was mistyped in, like the information is not correct. So for example, um, if you look at like a FICO score and FICO score is like, I don't know, 1,050, we know FICOs don't go that high. So it's clearly like a mistake. Uh, these would need to be handled or corrected in some way as an outlier. Uh, missing values are a similar scenario here. Where you should be looking at the missing values. Um, is there a lot of them? If there's too many of them, maybe you shouldn't be using that data, right? That variable, it just doesn't make any sense why there's so many missing. Um, if there's also missing values, there's other ways to handle them. For example, like weight of evidence, um, you can do like mean binning if it's appropriate given your situation. But anyways, you need to look at the missing values, look at percentages of missing values and try to figure out how they're being handled in the code that was provided by the developers. Um, the next one is going to be sampling. A lot of times we're gonna use sampling, especially in different areas of finance, such as credit risk, where you have massive data sets. Um, was the sampling conducted correctly? Was the methodology for the sampling correct for this given you know, model or purpose? Um, is it random? Is it weighted? If it's weighted, is it weighted correctly? Does it represent your portfolio? Um, does it represent the population you're trying to model? All of these things need to be looked at and tested from a validation perspective. A lot of this should be justified and tested in the developer's code, but if it's not, you will need to do this and figure out, you know, is there an issue? If there is, you write a finding. Okay, so now next we're gonna talk about model theory. Model theory we're gonna dive into here is was segmentation conducted? Does it add value or could it be better? So a lot of times we do segmentation 
there are different ways to go about doing segmentation. You need to test the segmentation of the model, make sure it was done correctly. Again, uh, validation here, you could find better ways to segment the data. So if you've worked at other banks, for example, a lot of times it's helpful to take past experiences and think about, you know, uh, I've seen segmentation done on these lines and it makes complete sense because, you know, that's how we did it. And then you need to go in and test the data and make sure it was done correctly. Make sure your methodology could be better. If it could, you know, you can write like a limitation or a recommendation. Uh, if the segmentation is not done correctly and it's pretty terrible, then you would write a finding here as well. Um, how are variables selected? Do they have business support and is it repeatable? I see this one as a really easy way to get findings. So our goal is not to get findings, but variable selection a lot of times is just done through an automated process. You'll do like cluster analysis and then you'll pick the top variables from each cluster and then you'll run it through something like stepwise regression, forward selection, backward selection. Uh, it's okay to do that, but as mentioned in here, right, is it supported by the business? So you're building a model as a developer for a business use. You should be interacting with that business to make sure what you're building meets what they are wanting. And as validation, we should go back in and look for this in the documentation of saying, uh, is this correct? Do they have support from the business? Does it make sense? If it doesn't make sense or the signs are backwards, right? This is where you would stop and say like, this is an issue and you try to figure out why it's the opposite of what you would think. And also it should be repeatable. So the model development process somewhat is automated in a lot of banks, but at the same time, there's gonna be some judgment calls made. You should document your judgment calls. You should document that you know you discussed with the business, these five variables, they picked these two variables, which might not be the most significant. However, uh, they provided this justification and that should be in the documentation and repeatable uh, by a validator or even someone just reviewing the document in general. All right, and now we're gonna look at what type of model is being used. Is it LLS, Logistic, Arima, Markov, Garch? I mean, you could do any type of model here. There's different modeling frameworks and structures um, for different areas. So for example, if you're doing, um, I don't know, like a time series model for seeker applications, uh, you might be using an ARIMA model. Uh, you might be using a Markov model if you're doing derivative pricing and discrete time. There's different things to look at. You need to stop and think about what type of model is being used. Is that type of model the most appropriate, right? Is that the one that you would automatically assume you would use? Um, if not, maybe you do some testing here and say like, you know, logistic was being used because it's bounded, so they use a logistic, but I think OLS would be better. I've seen some papers supporting OLS as a better predictor, you know, in this scenario. And then as a validator, you could go back and do testing to see if OLS using the current variables in the logistic regression would be okay. Maybe you go back and do variable selection, but you can come back and say, you know, given logistic looks okay for this validation. Um, OLS is also another alternative that should be considered in the future. Or if the model fails for some reason, so you look at it and has terrible fit, which we're gonna talk about later in the outputs. Um, this could be a finding in the sense that it's the wrong model structure. This is crucial and key in time series models because I constantly see uh, failed models across the industry uh, people just don't follow the statistical testing, which is gonna be the next bullet here. Um, were the correct assumptions tested? Do they support the model type? Are there better alternative models? So even in the ARIMA structure and framework, so for me, this includes autoregressive moving average, autoregressive moving average, and autoregressive integrated moving average models. Um, it could even do ARIMAX, which is typically what's used for CCAR, but all these are under a one umbrella for me under ARIMA. Did you have the right structure? Did you conduct the correct test? Did you pass the tests, right? These are things you need to look at as a validator and figure out like they provided this model, you know, they have all these justifications on why they're using it. They, you know, fits better than last year's. It looks great. Uh, it passed, you know, these five tests. However, it failed three tests, right? Then you need to go back and look here at the model theory, the model structure and figure out, is it correct? Could it be done better? Um, if so, again, validation should be providing justification and data showing um, you did X, Y, and Z, but there's also alternative approaches that are going to be better that you should explore um, in the future or you should explore for redevelopment of this model. All right, now the third section here is gonna be output. This is where everybody gets excited, right? This is the charts, the plots, um, the final conclusions. Um, but things to look at is how accurate is the model, right? We're all thinking this, we're all like wanting to know what's gonna happen here. Are the model errors normally distributed? Um, 
Is the model accurate enough for our use? So the business might have requirements on we're predicting, you know, pricing, for example. They want it as accurate as possible. These are things you need to consider in the model itself and looking at different charts, testing, see if the developers did this type of testing. Uh, if you have other creative ways to review what was done, uh, this is where you can add value to the validation itself and do a few other tests just to help support the evidence that the developers have or to help prove that maybe um, this isn't the best way to actually test this or it's not the best model they could have been using. In contrast to accuracy is always going to be stability, robustness, and reasonable models. So having the most accurate model is not always the goal. Um, overfitting is one of the key issues in models across all types of models and all areas of finance and even outside of finance for model development is overfitting, overfitting, overfitting. Um, stability is also something very desirable, especially in models where they're going to be used for longer periods. So something like CCAR, for example, you might run this model a few times a year. Um, it would be nice to have the model last a few years at minimum, but it's not super crucial that it's going to last, you know, maybe five, 10 years. It's really not possible uh, for most cases. And so, you know, stability and robustness is going to be a focus here. Accuracy is gonna be kind of the trade-off here, but we want something that's in the middle, fairly accurate, fairly robust. Most models, you're gonna want a good balance of this so that you have a strong uh, theoretical understanding of what's causing your prediction, um, as well as having a good prediction and minimal errors. Does it meet the business needs is going to be the next point here. So the business is going to have specific needs. The developers need to listen to the business owners. Uh, as a validator, you need to look and make sure that what was specified that was supposed to be built was actually built, that the model performs and does what is required from the developers. Um, this happens occasionally you know, a model developer doesn't quite listen or they don't quite understand. And so validation needs to go in and make sure the model is doing exactly what it was supposed to do. And then finally here, some of my favorite things to look at is missing variables. So again, this comes back to the errors, right? You're looking at the output, you're looking at the fit. Um, a lot of times you might have a little bit of a bias, maybe it passes, the errors are normally distributed. However, there might be a skewedness, there might be some serial correlation left over, there might be some heteroscedasticity in the data. And so we need to go back in and see, is there something missing? Is there a missing variable? If there is, validation should go in and you know maybe do some exploration. At minimum, write a finding or like a limitation or a recommendation here stating, you know, we looked at the residuals. While they seem almost normal, there does seem to be some serial correlation in the data. Um, and then you can leave it at that. If you wanted to dig deeper and you want to do a better job at validation, you would go in and say, you know, this is the limitation. We saw X, Y, and Z as before. However, you could have added these two variables or you could have added one of these three variables and that would have corrected for it. Or maybe going back to the original here, maybe your model structure is incorrect. Maybe you should have added, you know, like a moving average component or maybe you should have added a lag or a differencing or something. Maybe you should have done something different to make this better. And then finally, we're going to look at failed assumptions showing up. So when you look at the model itself, you look at the tests that were conducted, you can't just go off of what the developers provide you. You need to think outside of the box. You need to be a statistician. You need to go in and think, you know, given this type of model structure, these are the types of tests that need to be ran. Did they conduct all the tests? Did they pass all the tests? Were they missing tests? Maybe you need to look at an alternative test because the results were kind of on the borderline. Again, going to the output here is going to be the crucial point of looking at how the model's performing, checking all the tests and maybe going back and running additional tests to make sure that it was done correctly. The theory lines up with the output and the output looks as it is expected um, given the need of the business. All right, number four here is documentation. Um, things to look for in documentation is, does the document accurately represent what the code is doing? So a lot of times people copy and paste to do documentation. This is quite terrible practice but it happens a lot but to save time on the developer side. But is the code actually doing what the documentation is saying? So maybe the documentation says, you know, we had these four types of exclusions, and yet when you go into the code, there's only three types of exclusions. Um, you need to look at these things, and this again could be a finding stating, you know, there's a mismatch between documentation and what was actually done in the code. And then number two here is gonna be my biggest point here. So could the model be understood by a developer or validator outside of the company with only the documentation. So this is gonna be part of like the replication here. Anybody with the documentation and the data and the code all provided to you. So for example, if you pull the validator from a different bank and put them in your seat, 
They should be able to validate from the very beginning to the very end with no interaction from the developer, okay? This is crucial for validation. There needs to be independence between validation and development. You need to be able to write documentation as a developer um, so that anyone can look at this and see the key issues, findings, and results. Make sure it's done correctly and clearly. Um, to me, this is the difference between a you know top of the line model developer and a bottom of the line, barely meeting requirements kind of job developer. Those that are good are gonna be able to write great documentation because they know every single thing in the process. They understand why they did everything. This is not challenging to do if you're a good developer. Um, if you're a developer where maybe you're doing different parts of the job, doing documentation can be a challenge because it's all split up between different developers. Um, but yet again, each person should be able to write their own sections and do this. Um, if not, you probably don't have the right development team. And the third bullet point here is, is there a clear and concise process for developing the model? Validation should not need to ask additional questions. So this ties into the second bullet point here, but there should be a process that you follow internally. Um, you don't want people doing like rogue things and experimenting with crazy different methodologies that haven't been tested or used internally, and then trying to fudge them in or like making adjustments to statistical tests saying, you know, we like to do it a different way. Um, there should be at least at minimum a policy and kind of a structure that you follow on the development team. Um, this should be reviewed by validation as well and validation should understand why you're doing things and making sure you're going through the correct steps and the correct processes throughout the entire model development process. And number four is clear explanations of modeling decisions and weaknesses should be present. No model is perfect. Models do not actually represent reality in the sense that it explains it perfectly. Uh, models are just representations of reality. We're never gonna get it perfect. Um, models are going to have weaknesses. These weaknesses should be explicitly listed in the documentation, okay? So things should be listed clearly as well. So when you do the development process, you might've went through, you did, for example, like a cluster analysis or a correlation analysis, and you pulled these top variables, but you didn't end up using all the top variables. Maybe you had 10 variables in your model and you used, I don't know, four of those top 10 and you used four from somewhere else that were lower in the list. You should have an explanation on why. Why did this happen? Did you talk to the business and the business told you these other variables mean more to us, they have more value, um, it makes more sense to have them in the model, uh, for example, or maybe you had something statistical, like you ran some test and there was 10 variables that were highly correlated. Only two of them were stationary or I1, so difference for stationary. And then you used only those two in the model because of the properties those variables had. These are things that should be documented. So somebody reading through the documentation would know, you know, these are the steps they followed, as mentioned before. They ended up deviating and doing X, Y, and Z because of these issues occurred. And so this is why we have the final model. Documentation is probably one of the most important aspects um, of development and validation and working with regulators, for example. Everybody should know from beginning to end what was done, why it was done, um, and be able to see clearly why this model is being used. So I can't emphasize documentation enough here, but documentation is one of the biggest failures um, in development teams globally. All right, and now the fifth section here is probably the most forgotten. Uh, this is model governance. There's entire teams called model governance teams. Um, Governance teams sit on both the development team and the validation team. You have your own governance people. Uh, but governance in general is going to be tracking, for example, model inventory. The model you developed, is it in inventory? Right? We need to track this. Uh, for validation perspective here as well, when we issue findings against the model, so we want things corrected from the model, um, you need to list inside of there, like these are the findings and we're gonna follow up with them within X amount of months and then they need to be fixed. And so governance would go through and track to make sure that we follow up with developers and the developers actually do what they were supposed to do uh, for model corrections. Another point is that model development needs to be documented in the request. So from that beginning stage where the business requests a model, Typically validation teams track these, um, right? They need to see the trail, the paper trail here. We wanna see that the business requested this model, development you know, was then allowed to build the model and then validation is going to validate the model. We need to make sure that everything was done in accordance and that we're tracking all this information so we can figure out you know, that which models are being used and make sure that the business is not using models that have not been developed and or validated correctly because this imposes a significant model risk when people go out and build models and then use them without having anybody else look at them or review them uh, for business needs or statistical standpoint. 
And then finally, the big key capstone point here is, is there an appropriate performance monitoring plan in place? This is not like someone goes in and reviews it and says, yeah, it looks okay. You need to have numbers in place. You need to have statistical tests in place that you use. So for example, uh, maybe you go in and you test like a refit of the model and look at the coefficients. Maybe you do a Gini test, right? Maybe you do KS. There's all kinds of things you can use on model performance. They should be within specific thresholds. So for again, it's not gonna be perfect, but maybe you don't want your coefficients to deviate by more than like 5%, for example. These need to be written down in document, and then when testing is done, say every quarter, every six months, annually, whatever, uh, you need to follow this procedure. This sets the threshold as well for when redevelopment will occur. So if a model fails or it's not doing so well, it's in that middle area, uh, we wanna make sure that we can develop a model in time to use it for the business needs so they're not stranded without a good model. And now to talk about the stages of validation maturity. So again, this is 100% my opinion. This is how I view things. Um, not everybody in the industry will agree. In fact, probably a lot of people won't agree with this, but this is how I view validation kind of maturity as a developed team. You have three stages here. You have replication, theoretical review, and you have challenger models. So a bare minimum validation team, especially when we just started, you know, like CCAR, for example, um, the replication is just going to be that bare minimum process. They went through, they read the documentation, um, they replicated everything. It all came out at the end. They are supposed to review like theoretical constructs and like stats and stuff. And a lot of times these teams are like junior teams. They don't really have developed staff. So they go through, they read things. To them, it makes a lot of sense, looks okay, and they sign off. Um, these banks are just the bare minimum banks. They're just baby validation teams. They really do need to up their validations. Um, the second tier of validation growth here is when teams really start digging in theoretical review. So you should be paying your staff here for validation really well because you should be bringing in experts in different statistics and financial applications um, for different areas. So usually validation teams will have someone who works on credit risk and they're a credit risk expert, okay? Then you have someone that works on, for example, like time series models, they're a time series expert, market risk, operational risk, PPNR, um, even different types of models like I mentioned, like the time series, you might have like a Markov model, you might have like logistics, scorecards, for example, all these different types of models, you should have experts internally that can look at things, review things at a much deeper level. Um, they should be challenging the theory and saying, wow, the industry has been doing this. Um, there are limitations, which we understand. We should be going deeper and forcing basically people to try new methodologies and kind of advancing here. So this is gonna be the team that's kind of pushing for data science now, right? They wanna look at other things. They wanna look at other theories. Um, you're gonna just be going a lot deeper than a standard replication and kind of a base validation. This is gonna be just a really deep understanding of the statistical side of it and ways to improve it. Um, again, you would see different issues, different ways to improve, and then you'd write findings or limitations or recommendations, and you'd list out here, um, these are the ways that they could be improved. The third final mature stage of a validation team is going to be the challenger model team. So this team's gonna go in, they're gonna do their replication first. They're gonna read their documentation, they're gonna run all their code, they're gonna look at the five areas we talked about, right? Data, um, the theoretical construct of the model, they're gonna look at the output, the documentation, and the governance, okay? Then they're gonna go back in and they're gonna develop challenger models to say, well, this was done correctly, validation wants to do additional testing, and we want to basically challenge development to even do a better job um, by finding other alternative models that might be better. So validation should go out there and they should be building challenger models to challenge, especially your big models for your bank. Um, so models, again, I didn't mention this earlier, but there are some models that do very little and they kind of mitigate a little bit of risk. And then you have massive models that manage entire like pricing portfolios, for example, in billions or trillions of dollars, like for example, a mortgage portfolio. And these models are gonna be crucial. Challenger models should be built by validation as well as development. Uh, validation really does need to be doing things from a higher perspective and challenging the paradigm of development, challenging the way they do things, and coming up with better methodologies for analysis and model development.
that's really a developed team here. You need to be doing all the stages. You need to be developing, looking at documentation, looking at the business logic, and then also doing advanced analytics and looking for better models out there that could help improve uh, risk management across the bank. So anyways, that's kind of my overview of what validation does, um, the different stages and things that we look at as a validation team, and a little bit about kind of like the findings and how things work. But anyways, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.